a deep dive into the ping pong project here on Machine Learning Basics. If you found this video useful, consider hitting that like button, which helps me know what videos people find more or less useful. At the same time, if you've gone through a couple of these and have found a couple of things that you find helpful, think about hitting that subscribe button or join us over at patreon.com and help support the show and help guide its direction. You can find a link down below in the description. Whatever you do, thank you for watching. All right. So we're going to just dive right on and get into this. I have a new GitHub page up. I'm struggling with it a little bit and getting the whole project up. I was going to just upload the thing as one giant project, and it looks like GitHub doesn't like the fact that I'm trying to commit a giant project all at once. So I will have the GitHub up. I'm going to get the files up there. Uh, but for now, I just want to dive in and uh, get into the content. I will at least show you the URL here, though, so it's... Uh, github.com uh, slash draglitch slash pongo that'll also be down in the video description um, so that you can go and clone this project and uh, mess about with it do whatever you want with it uh, it is going to be MIT licensed and I have used only content that was provided from unity as part of the base uh, unity application and their ML agents stuff um, and then whatever I've written, which is MIT licensed. So uh, you should be able to go download this and do pretty much whatever you want with it, uh, since a lot of the stuff is uh, provided to us uh, from Unity. So as you see, uh, standard layout of the project here. Here's the scene. There's the game view. This is what we were showing earlier, left paddle, right paddle, scoreboard, and environment. Um, and then the asset store, we don't need that, so we'll just close that tab for now. And uh, if we look at the left on the side here, here's our hierarchy. Um, so I'm going to hit play real quick just so that we can uh, see again what we're doing. So we have a left AI versus a right AI. These two were trained in slightly different ways, so you can see that they behave uh, very differently and that the left AI seems to be doing uh, quite a bit better than the right AI in most circumstances. It's uh, much more reactive to what's going on. Um, in either of these cases, you can also take over as the user and play the left paddle or the right paddle. So um, I'm just going to go through everything. We're doing a deep dive. We're going to get right in here and uh, go through basically every game object and every script. It shouldn't actually take that long. Um, main camera is the main camera. Without it, you don't see anything, so uh, that's pretty standard fare. Same with the directional light. The post-process volume, that's just there to make things look nice. If you haven't gotten into the post-processing stack at all, or post-process V2, um, it makes a big difference to the overall look and feel of your game. Uh, in this case, we have some vignetting, we have some color correction, and so you can see that it adds a really nice layer of polish to make the game look a bit more complete. However, going into the post-processing stack and everything that you can do with it is far beyond uh, the topics of this video. I mean, there's you can see you know, a number of effects going on right now with color grading and bloom and vignetting and all that. And so that's a really a whole nother topic. And I'm sure there are other people that are going into the post-processing uh, volume the post-processing stack that is available for free from unity um, and then here are some of the uh, volume settings this is this is the shadows and the environment procedural sky um, and again this is just environmental stuff right so if i turn that off the shadows look super different and, and whatnot um, not really important for the mechanics of the game but it does matter for you know just uh how how it looks you know this is a, a really nice polished looking environment and so um these are very important for that but again it's outside the scope of really what we're talking about um likewise if you go into unity and you start a new high definition render pipeline project you're going to get a bunch of example assets and this environment uh, that you see here is 
very close to the initial environment. I've removed a bunch of stuff and then I've set up this scoreboard and playing field on top of one of the assets that they have. But I've really used things just straight out of what they provided. I've, I've created very little custom here. You know, I've taken some of their lumber and duplicated it and then shortened it to be the paddles, right? Um, not anything uh, terribly crazy. <clears throat> so, um, and in fact, these example assets, we can turn off that whole set of example assets and this game should run fine, right? It doesn't look nearly as nice, but all of that is just set dressing. Um, so we don't really need any of that. And again, um, these are all the props and everything that come with the high definition render pipeline example. Um, if you haven't messed around with that, uh, I do recommend that you do. If you ever suspect that you might work with a high definition render pipeline, it is different than working with the traditional Unity rendering. So it's worth going into and playing with a little bit. Um, then going into uh, the actual work that really went into this. So both the Pongo and the Academy. Um, so Pongo, this is just a collection for everything for this game. Again, I like to put everything under one game object so that it's easy for me to duplicate it so that if I go into training scenarios where I need to make multiple iterations and have multiple copies uh, training all at the same time, that it's trivial for me to do that. Um, so the right paddle, let's see what we have here. Um, Right, so it's standard transform. There is the uh, stud model that came from Unity, Mesh Render, Box Collider, right? So it's a part of the physics system. So we're using the physics to do the collisions and uh, the interaction. The scale velocity script. Uh, basically, all this scale velocity script does is that when a ball hits a paddle, um, instead of relying on just the Unity interactions um, in the physics engine, uh, I find that sometimes uh, for super basic behaviors like we're dealing with, it's actually a little too much. Um, and so in this case, I just wanted to do a real simple uh, amount of logic here, right? So um, when you start up with this scale velocity script, the first thing that the script does is find and cache its own rigid body because it's going to use its own rigid body in a lot of those collisions and you don't want that uh, get component call in your update or on collision enter. Um, get component and find object especially um, can be kind of a slow call so for something like this uh, you want to put that in your start so that uh, it gets it once and then always knows um, it always holds a reference to that rigid body. Uh, so then on collision enter so anytime an object collides with this thing that is going to scale the velocity. Um, we're basically going to just check and say, hey, um, did I collide with the ball? Right? And then if I did collide with the ball, we initialize uh, this impart variable. And then if I have a rigid body, then I get the z velocity of the rigid body, and then I impart. Uh, I have this impart z velocity amount. So that means uh, that if I'm moving up or down, I'm going to take a portion of that up down movement and then I'm going to add that to the ball, right? So that as I'm moving up, if the ball's coming at me straight and I'm moving up, uh, when the ball bounces, it's actually going to m go up a little bit as well. Um, then uh, it checks to see if there are any events that are listening for a, a bounce command. Uh, if there are, it invokes them. And then we take the, um, the ball's rigid body. We, we go to the ball, we find its rigid body, and we find its velocity, and then we transform it. So in the case of the paddle, it's going to be um, reversing the x direction and then also adding uh, the um, amount that we've decided to import in the z direction. And then there's also 
a bit of randomness that we add as well. And I know in the previous video, some of the people saw the randomness of the ball and they said, that's not realistic. And you're right, it's not. Um, I have the randomness turned up for a reason. Uh, I want to expose my AI to as many uh, varieties of interactions as I can. And part of that is making sure that you don't get into a steady state where the ball is just going perfectly horizontal back and forth or gets into a state where it's very nearly like that. And so it isn't able to explore the entire uh, potential uh, number of states, right? So I want randomness and I want a greater degree of randomness when I'm training than I necessarily will in the game. So if I were going to say, okay, this is a ready done game, I'd probably dial that randomness way down, um, if not set it to zero, but the ball and will, because the AI that we're training in this case doesn't have memory, it's, it's not like an um, LTSM or something like that, long LSTM, excuse me. Uh, since it's not an LSTM or something similar to that, it's um, it, it only looks at the ball's current state and the current trajectory and also the opponent's paddle, and that's all it knows. And so I want to make sure that we get as broad a variety of positions and trajectories and opponent positions as we can, um, which is part of the reason why we are adding a fairly significant amount of randomness here. Okay. Um, and... It is, however, a public variable, and it was uh, designed that way so that you can play with it. You can turn it up, you can turn it down, you can turn it off. Um, you can do all kinds of things with that randomness. Um, okay, so that's a skill velocity. So in that skill velocity is used in a couple places, so that's used on the paddles, right? So when the ball comes and it hits the paddle, it reverses the X direction, right? Which makes sense, it bounces and then goes back and then it maintains the direction in the Y and maintains the direction in the Z. So Y, it shouldn't have any direction. Um, and then the Z is gonna be, in our case, uh, the up-down axis here. And so it will just maintain whatever that Z is. So it reverses the X, maintains Y and Z. And then the random wiggle, in this case, is only happening on the Z axis instead um, and then this is also the amount of the paddle's Z velocity that we are imparting onto uh, the ball. And in this case, we also had no listeners for an on bounce. Um, I wasn't sure whether or not we we're going to need that. Um, I am gonna jump just a, real quick. I'm gonna come back to this paddle, but I wanna show you that this scale velocity script is reused at the top and the bottom, right? And so in these, in these cases, we are keeping the X and Y uh, velocities, but then um, reversing it on the Z, right? And so again, since the Z is the uh, up down of our, our playing field here, that makes sense. So if it hits the top one, it's going to keep moving left or right at the same speed. It's not going to be moving, um, you know, to or from the camera because we want, you know, in this case it's a two dimensional game, but then the Z axis um, you know, it hits the, the top here and then it gets reversed down. Um, uh, there is again, a random wiggle that happens on both the X and the Z. And so again, this is where some people are, are noting some, you know, strangeness with, um, you know, saying that the ball really doesn't behave correctly and, and you are correct. Um, and then also this impart Z velocity amount is 0 0.25. In this case, neither of these has a Z velocity, so it doesn't actually matter. I should have probably zeroed that out, but I didn't. Um, but, you know, it, it's kind of a, a, a no op since the Z velocity of the top border and the bottom border wall here are going to be zero. Um, and then also you'll see the um, score areas also have um, the scale velocity script. In theory, they shouldn't be needed because they also have a score script. Um, but what you know what happens is I made one and then um, just duplicated it. And so uh, these ended up with the scale velocity. But I, I did want to show that the scale velocity, uh, by having that component just be about uh, the interaction of velocity with the ball, that that is able to get reused in multiple places in the game. Um, rigid body, this is a standard rigid body. 
Um, it has a mass, it has drag, so that when you press a button on the keyboard or when the computer issues a command, you are adding force to the paddle and that the paddle will naturally accelerate and decelerate uh, with mass and drag and angular drag and all of that. However, um, we have turned off all of the rotation and we are only allowing it to move in the z-axis. Um, so it, it is using the physics system, but it's also using a very limited portion of it that is appropriate just for uh, this game. And then lastly, we have the Pongo agent. Um, I'm going to save this for a little later, I think, because the uh, Pongo agent script is fairly uh, in-depth. Um, I will, however, yeah, open it up in Visual Studio so it's ready to go when we're ready to talk about it. Um, from there, we have the ball. Uh, the ball has, um, again, just it's a sphere. It has a mesh renderer, it has a sphere collider, it has a rigid body, so it's using physics. We have frozen the Y position so that um, if there are any physics weirdness stuff that happens, which is sometimes the case with Unity, uh, that it is sure to be locked in the Y position and that it doesn't like fly towards the camera or something like that um, because we haven't accounted for that kind of behavior. The initial force script, this is where I had a bug that I had talked about a little bit. Um, so this is worth discussing. Um, so again, the initial force, so when you start a game, the ball is in the center of the playing field and it has no velocity, right? And so it's just sitting there and not moving anywhere. Um, I have this show broken behavior boolean so that I can turn on and off the broken behavior that I'm about to show you. Um, again, my rigid body, uh, this is just caching the rigid body, and then the minimum magnitude, um, this is the minimum amount of speed that the ball is allowed to have um, at any point in time. One of the things that you can do when you're using like the Unity physics engine or something like that is there's no uh, rules to say that there's a, a minimum speed. However, realistically in gameplay, even if you're playing actual air hockey with a friend or something, right, sometimes the the puck will move very slowly across the board and it's kind of boring. And so in this case, I actually enforce a speed minimum just to keep things moving. Again, it's not super helpful to the computer if you know it has to sit there and wait and wait and wait for the ball to actually come, especially since the computer in this case um, doesn't, we're not using any kind of memory. Um, so uh, basically, um, our update is called, right? And then if the velocity, the X velocity is zero or the Y velocity is zero, um, this is where I start adding some initial force. So if you're sitting there in the middle of the board, <clears throat> um, I wanna add some initial force. It's also true if you ever enter a state where the ball is moving perfectly horizontal or even worse is if the ball somehow moves perfectly vertical because we are adding randomness um, there is a chance that the ball could end up going uh, perfectly um, vertical and that means that the game could never win um, or, or it could just take forever um, because we do have the randomness it would probably eventually you know come out of being uh, perfectly vertical, uh, but again, you don't want to be sitting there waiting for that to happen, right? We want we want this to have be a structured game where the ball is going back and forth, um, and so this randomness here ensures that uh, we never get a case where things are perfectly horizontal, perfectly vertical, or uh, at a standstill. Um, this also continues for while the velocity is. Uh, the magnitude of the velocity is below a certain threshold, um, I am going to just keep adding velocity until we reach a certain threshold so that, again, we maintain that the game uh, stays playable. In this case, that threshold when I did the training was fairly high. I wanted to keep the ball moving at a fairly rapid pace. Um, your mileage may vary. Uh, you may decide that it's okay for the ball to be a little on the slower side, um, but you probably don't want to remove this entirely because otherwise you'll have, again, 
you might get a ball that's moving 0.01 meters a second, and that is uh, pretty slow and kind of tedious to watch it. The ball just kind of slowly roll across the screen. Um, <clears throat> so the sign override. Um, so we have this uh, add force, right? And then we have this sign override. So basically, this is where I had a bug um, in my uh, initialization code. And what was happening, and I'll click this show broken behavior checkbox. What was happening is that um, when you start at zero, right, uh, there is no sign to whether or not your velocity is positive or negative because it's zero. And I thought that had been taken into account with the algorithm uh, where I was <clears throat> um, uh, initializing it and saying, hey, what is the sign of my velocity? Well, in this case, it the mathf.sign isn't really the sign of it where you get another value in case, you know, where you get a value if it's negative or positive or zero. It's really, you know, this will tell you if it's negative or not. And so what's happening is when the value was zero, it was saying, oh yeah, the value is positive. And so I kept, you know, increasing a positive value. What the upshot was every time that the game started, the ball would always move in a positive direction, right? Because I was trying to just speed up the ball in the direction it was already going, as opposed to <clears throat> adding yet even more randomness because that got really weird. Um, and so by speeding the ball up in the direction it was always going, when the ball was at zero, um, it would always assume that the ball was going positive and that was not necessarily the case. So this <clears throat> checkbox is there just to allow you to see what happens um, if you don't uh, take this into account. And that's why you have the sign override uh, routine is so that we have, have the ability to demonstrate or not demonstrate the broken behavior. Um, but ultimately, yes, the, the whole idea here is that we want to take a random range and, um, and so in, in this case, we're getting a random sign, which is going to be negative one, um, zero, or one, and then we, <clears throat> I'm sorry, yes, it's ne we, we know the actual sign is negative one, zero, or one, and so in this case, if we know that the value is zero, then we are randomly picking negative one or one, and then we are using that to make an assignment, and so basically picking a direction if we're not going in a particular direction. Um, so that's in that initial four script, and that's where I had the bug that caused, cost me a lot of time. Uh, the ball script, um, so this is uh, just the ball paying attention to how it is being played in the game. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. Once again, uh, we have a cache of my rigid body, right? So you'll see that in the start. You'll, you'll see me do this a lot. Um, on awake, the first thing that it does is it says, hey, where is the start position? Where should I be starting in the game? And so it pulls that from the current um, transform position. And that is not necessarily 0, 0, 0, as it is not in this case. Uh, because I built this on top of an existing project, right? The, the origin point for the scene was not what I would normally do for the origin point for this game. So it was very important that when I initialized the game, that the ball looked where it was in relation to its environment and again saves off that variable and says this is my starting position so that any time that I reset uh, we reset to this start position as opposed to zero zero um, and so sure enough there it is uh, when it gets the command to reset the ball it takes its transform position makes it the start position and then also clears out any velocity information that it has. It's also a good habit. I don't need to do it in this case because the ball doesn't spin, uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and uh, add it here. Um, right. Um, right, 
That's quaternion. Of course it is. Um, at the very onset, it's good habit if you're resetting the ball to actually pull out um, the rotation and uh, set it to either zero or identity. It would be perfectly legitimate uh, since we're pulling out the rigid body here um, to also uh, do be consistent and say, um, you know, the starting velocity is equal to the rigid body's current velocity and the rotation is the rigid body's current rotation. That way, every time you start the game um, that you're using um, an initialization uh, mechanism, whether it's set it to zero or set it to its starting point. Um, let's see here. So there's the arena, right? And we've already gone over the bottom, the left, the right. Um, so these all have the scale velocity and then the left panel and the right panel also have the score script. Um, the score script is likewise very simple. Um, hello, score script, there it is. Um, it's about as simple as they get, right? And so uh, basically it's keeping track of uh, the player, right? So the score zone keeps track of the, the player that it benefits. And then uh, if there's a collision and with the ball, then the uh, player on the opposite side of the field benefits, right? So on the right-hand side, we have a reference to the left panel paddle. And then on the left-hand side, we have a reference to the right paddle. And so that's the player that benefits. Um, that's all there is to that. Uh, and then, yep, the top and bottom we've already talked about. Uh, scoreboard. Uh, so we have a right score, a left score, and a dash. Um, these are all standard text message, uh, text meshes um, that are in world space, um, as opposed to like UI stuff that's in world space. But yeah, these are text meshes. Um, text meshes in Unity can be a little weird with transparency and how things work. Um, they don't always behave quite like you expect them to. And I'm trying to get an artifact to show up, but I don't think it's doing it in this case. Um, but sometimes you can see through them when you don't intend to or see them through things when you don't intend to. Um, and so that can be problematic. Uh, for what we're doing here, though, they are totally sufficient. Um, and so, um, you know, they're just standard text meshes uh, has a mesh render and says, you know, this is what our scores are. Um, these are, don't have any behaviors on them. They are controlled externally uh, by the game. And then the dash is just uh, sitting there in the middle. And so, all right, let's go back to that paddles, that agent script. And so now that we've gone through all of these, uh, we are looking at the right paddle. And so we will see um, it has a reference to itself. It has a reference to the opponent's paddle. It has a reference to the goal, which in this case is the left board there. Um, it has the current score, a reference to the ball, the text mesh uh, that it will change when it scores, um, the amount of force used to move the paddle up and down, not the amount of force that the paddle imparts on the ball. Um, and then we get into our ML stuff, which is uh, reward if the point is scored, reward if the point is lost, or reward if we hit the ball, and the max score for the game. So let's dive into this. Um, so again, a paddle, it's yourself, opponent paddle, the other player, the goal, the score, uh, the ball, the score mesh. Um, so that's the text mesh that we just want to update. Um, the force to move up and down, starting position. Uh, so this is gonna be very familiar, uh, same as with the ball, right? Uh, its own rigid body, the ball's rigid body, and the opponent's rigid body. We use those a lot. Uh, we have to observe those in order to feed that information to the ML agents. And so again, we are getting that at the start of the game, caching it, and then providing it. Um, here are the rewards, and again, with my uh, default values that I tried with um, 
let's see here, Pongo agent of the opponent, a, the script for the game ball, and the current score. So when it wakes up, again, we grab our starting position and we cash our rigid body. Um, when things have started, so the difference between awake and start, people ask me this a lot. Awake is when you are interacting with yourself and you're initializing yourself. Not everybody becomes awake in the same order, right? So you can have race conditions. If you reference external to yourself, there's a race condition whether that other thing exists first or if you exist first. So it's really important that when you're in your awake period that you're only doing internal references to the game object and its components. In the start, there's still a race condition as to who has started first, but everybody's been through the awake process, right? So everybody awakes first in a random indeterminate order, and then everybody starts again in a random indeterminate order, but you know that everybody's been through the awake and so should then be self-initialized by that point. So that's why I'm caching the rigid bodies in the awake, and then, or I'm sorry, I'm caching my own rigid body in the awake, and then I'm caching other people's rigid bodies in the start, All right? Um, so yeah, grabbing the rigid bodies, making sure that I have references to them, as well as the Pongo agent in the ball. Uh, we initialize ourself, we set the score to zero, and then we set the score mesh text, so we're just setting the display um, to our score. Um, okay, and then when we reset the agent, when the game resets, right, we move back to our starting position in world space, we set our velocity to zero, we set the score to zero, and then we update the scoreboard. When we collect observations, so as the game is playing, every frame of the game, the, um, or well, yeah, every, every frame where the ML agent is going to try to make an observation and a decision, it goes out to the world, collects all the information about the world, provides it to the neural network, right? So this is where we're adding a vector observation for the ball's position, and then we're also getting the ball's velocity, and we're getting our own position and our own velocity, and then we're also getting the goal's position versus the ball's position. So how far is the ball from the goal? And so this is <clears throat> these are the observations that we've made. Um, haven't made any observations about the other paddle. Um, certainly uh, something that we could do, uh, but it's not something that we've done in this case. So basically the game in this case, it's the paddle is playing the ball, the paddle is not playing the other player necessarily. Uh, the other player is not taken into account when it's making its decisions. Um, so that, that's the data that we're gathering and then we add that to the vector observation. And then when it's come time to make an action, um, basically it's um, saying, all right, well, first of all, it's doing a check. Um, you know, it, this is designed to be in discrete action space. We can go up or down or do nothing. Those are the only options that we're allowed in this case. Um, and then we interpret the actions from the agent, right? So up, down, or nothing. Um, ML agents only does zero or above, so they have no negative values that come out of Unity ML agents. So you'll get zero, one, two. And so we need to map that to, <coughs> excuse me, um, negative one, one, or zero. All right, so if the action is two, then we're interpreting that as down. If the action um, is less than zero, then we're interpreting that as down. That line is actually superfluous. Um, and then if the action is greater than zero, then we're interpreting that as one. Um, this could probably be cleaned up to be a little more clear. Um, originally, when I first wrote this code, I forgot to, to include a do nothing state. And so the ball or the paddle had to be moving at all times. Um, and that was pretty disastrous. So having it be able to sit still was super important. So that's why that code is um, uglier than it has any right to be. Um, Uncollision enter. So this is <clears throat> when the ball and the paddle meet. Now the paddle can also collide with the top and the bottom. Um, those are valid collisions. We just don't do anything when that happens. 
So in this case, the only collision we care about is if um, we collide with the ball and then we call hit ball if we do. Um, and so this is me just getting uh, as much logic as I can out of on, my on collision enter um, into another routine. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in this case, we're just adding the reward for the ball being hit. Um, and then we have a public void lose point. Um, this is called by um, the uh, score zones as opposed to um, uh, being being called by, uh, yeah, this is called externally as opposed to being called internally. We're not paying attention to the ball state. We're letting the ball do the collisions and then let a ball and the goals do their collisions and notify people of their states and take action as opposed to um, uh, trying to do too much here. So um, for score point, um, if I score point, then my score increases, right? Um, if my score is the max score, then the game is over, right? We, we let the opponent know that we're done. We call done ourselves. Um, we, if the game is not done, then we just increment <clears throat> our, um, you know, we've incremented our score, so we update our scoreboard. We ha add a reward uh, for ourselves if the point is scored, and then we also let the opponent know um, that they have lost a point, right? And so you'll see that here, here, and then we notify the game to, we notify the game ball to reset. So score point um, is called um, externally uh, and then lose point even though you'll see a reference internally here it's called externally so it's called from the other paddle because each paddle has a reference to each other and then the paddle tells the ball to reset. So you will see um, if we go back here to score point right we have this player agent score point so the scoreboard the sorry the goal the, the right hand goal tells the left hand paddle you've scored the point. The left hand paddle will then go through, it'll increment its score, finish the game if it needs to finish, otherwise it'll update the scoreboard, notify the right hand paddle to reset and that it has lost a point and then notify the ball to go back to the beginning of the game. Let's see here, what else do we have? So that is most of the Pongo agent, if not all of it, I think that's all of it, all right? Hit point, lose reward, score point. Um, that is all of that. Um, the game manager in this case is actually empty. Um, I should have removed that game object. Um, the a lot of times I'll have like the game manager keep track of the major components and the score. In this case, the game was simple enough that the paddles were just able to um, keep track of it. The, or yeah, at least the player agents were able to keep track of everything and I didn't need a, a third uh, game object to just keep tra track of all that and keep it all straight. Um, so the academy, so this is a standard uh, generic academy. Um, you've probably seen this code before. Um, it in you know, generic academy inherits from academy and doesn't do anything um, at all interesting. There's nothing fancy going on with this academy. And then we have our right brain and left brain, and these are the standard Unity brains. Um, now, what we've done in this case is uh, there is a graph scope, uh, right brain and uh, left brain if you're trying to train both brains at once, you need that graph scope. Um, so depending on uh, what you get out of your training, if you're training both at once, you need to scope them so that your right brain and your left brain are in distinct namespaces so that the training works on them individually. If you're only training one brain at a time, then you don't need a graph scope. Now, I will say, um, I did not, for this project, normalize the position and orientation to the perspective of the player, right? So in this case, the right brain is trying to get the ball to a negative Z position and the left brain is trying to get the ball to a positive Z position. And so their internal logic 
is going to work that such that they want the ball to be in the negative uh, or positive. I'm sorry, I said Z. Uh, I meant X. Um, they want the ball to be in the uh, negative X or positive X position, and and that is their objective, right? You could write the code so that you could have one brain and that it's normalized so that you know you're in this position and you're facing. Um, you know, certain direction, and then you want the ball as far away from you as possible, as opposed to necessarily be in the positive x direction. So the reason why that's important is because it means that in this current configuration, you cannot take a right brain and put it on a left paddle, because what's going to happen is if you take this right brain and put it on the left paddle, it's going to see the ball going in um, the negative x direction and it's going to be like oh great um i'm not going to screw with that right and uh it's it's not going to behave as it should because um it thinks that as the ball is going this way uh that's what it wants right um so it would be it's a little more math and a little more work uh but it's also probably better that if you did things from the perspective of the paddle and so um, I mean, really, ultimately, you can see that this paddle, you know, is, you know, has the blue arrow facing that way. If you turned this one around um, and then, uh, you know, you would see that the blue arrow is now facing this way. And then you'd have to do all of the math so that it's calculating distances in relation to its direction. Um, then you could use the same brain for both the left and the right paddles. Uh, but I did not do that for this example. So... Uh, there it is. There's the deep dive. Um, gone through pretty much every line of code, every script, every game component. It's been a while since I've actually worked on this project, unfortunately. Um, holidays have been uh, crazy busy. Life has just been busy. Um, if this is useful, uh, again, as always, hit the like button. Leave comments below. I'm happy to address them as best I can. Uh, in the meantime, I'm also trying to figure out what I want to do as a next uh, project is the next game. We've certainly done, uh, we've done Lunarlander, we've done a Pong type game. Um, if there are other games that people want to look into, um, then I'm absolutely open to it. Uh, there is also somebody who's asking about um, some robotic sorting and could we try doing a, a vision based robotic sorting uh, type project, which sounds uh, new and interesting to me, something that I haven't tried before. So, um, you know, I, I like the idea of doing that. Uh, but if people do have uh, other things that they they want to learn about uh, with the Unity machine learning agents, please let me know in the comments and um, I will see what I can do about addressing uh, some of those topics. So in the meantime, good luck and happy learning. Take care and I'll hopefully see you soon.